An insane eight players will rock the purple and gold for the first time in 21-22. Following the GM slash Rob Palenka's busy offseason, I'm going to be fully evaluating the Lakers roster overhaul by answering questions like, can Russell Westbrook be that legit third guy? And is the core too old to make a championship run? Right quick, over three quarters of the people who watch this channel are not subscribed, so if you fall into that percentage, help the channel get to 50k by subscribing. Also, quickly leave a like on this video, it takes a few seconds and makes a huge difference. The connections of the GM, along with the actual general manager Rob Palenka, desperately looked for an answer for LA's 2021 playoff disappointment. I know I had the infamous nickname the GM on my thumbnail, but Palenka's got a reputable history in the front office since joining the Lakers in 2017. When Magic Johnson left in April of 2019, Rob took the reins as the main man in charge and has shown he's great at both managing personnel and player relationships. Following the death of his close friend Kobe Bryant, Palinka helped LeBron deliver a championship to the city of Los Angeles in 2020, but most recently, we saw a completely different Lakers team. They looked gassed after going directly from the bubble finals into training camp of the 2021 season. Given LA ranked 15th among playoff teams in three-pointers made, three-point percentage, and assists per game, shot creation around LeBron and AD, along with a flurry of deep range shooting, were two of the Lakers' biggest needs. We'll start with the most significant move by far, and that was trading for 2017's most valuable player, a nine-time All-NBA player, a two-time scoring champ, and a three-time assist leader, the Lakers received two second round picks as well and sent Kuzma, Contavious Caldwell Pope, Montrez Harrell, and pick number 22 in this year's draft to Washington. The Wizards would use that pick to trade for Drew's brother Aaron Holiday and the number 31 pick. In terms of the veterans they shipped off to Washington, the four year product of Utah, the former Ute Kyle Kuzma, failed to build off an all rookie first team season. Kuzma will have a fresh start in DC, but he's coming off a series against Phoenix where he completely let down LA's number one option. James was near the top of the MVP race during the regular season, and while he was playing on two injured ankles, he still found a way to post 23, 8, and 7 on efficient shooting splits. With Anthony Davis out and hobbled for the most part when he did play, the Lakers needed Kuzma to match the production of Phoenix's role players. But Kuz made an unacceptable 23% of his field goals, 10% of his three-pointers, and 40% of his free throws. Therefore, the Lakers were in the right to put him on the trade block. I've seen a lot of people making the argument that LA lost this trade because Westbrook can't shoot, Westbrook's a stat patter, and so on and so forth. I haven't heard a lot of talk about how little the Lakers had to give up to acquire a man who, back in the prime of his career, was the most athletically overpowering backcourt player we've ever seen. The triple-double king, Russell freaking Westbrook. In addition to a pick and Kuzma, Montrez Harrell's lack of floor spacing and defense had him benched in these recent playoffs. Like Kuzma, Caldwell Pope shot under 15% from three-point range against Phoenix. So that's all it took to get a top 10 point guard right now and top 5 point guard of this era in Russ. And while his vertical isn't what it was when he played next to Kevin Durant in OKC, let's not lie to ourselves about how much Westbrook has left in the tank at age 32. He's still a ferocious dunker, and he's figured out how to brilliantly manage the pace of the game. Let's forget about his bad shot selection for a split second and assume that gets better with the voice of LeBron James, Coach Frank Vogel, and also Rob Palinka's mentorship and strategic advice that he's going to give to Russ, I think that has an impact on how he fits into the offense. You got one of the best athletes ever pairing up with LeBron and AD, and for that, this Laker team deserves all the hype it's getting. A dominant run through the West in 2020 was followed up in 2021 by LeBron's first ever opening round series loss, making him 14-1 in those scenarios. He needs more help. Carmelo's one of the greatest pure buckets of all time, he should do just that. While he's not the Denver or New York version of himself, Melo can still give you 15 to 20 points on a nightly basis, and given he's a small ball four, 
we should see a ton of action where Melo's setting screens for LeBron and then popping out to shoot threes. The two future Hall of Famers entered the league together in 2003. They've been rivals on the court and friends off of it since high school. Now, LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony join forces in Los Angeles. Call Carmelo a ring chaser all you want, but the superstar turned role player made a league 35th best 40.9% of his shots from behind the three point line. Another big time pickup from the GM God was luring back a man who was crucial securing championship number four for James and number 17 for LA, Dwight Howard. He formerly held the title of Superman before having it taken away by Giannis recently, but if there's one stat that defines the value of Dwight, it's this one. The Lakers led all playoff teams in blocks per game during their playoff run in 2020, but they were 12th out of 16 in that area in 2021's playoffs. The Lakers desperately missed the defensive backbone that Howard was. After playing next to Kobe in the early 2010s and then being an underrated part of a title run, Howard spent one season in Philadelphia where he played fairly well, now Dwight suiting up for his third tenure in Laker threads. After building a brick house in the playoffs, career 35 plus percent three-point shooters Trevor Ariza and Kent Bazemore will help the Lakers floor spacing. But the most reputable deep range marksman who's about to rock the purple and gold for the first time is Wayne Ellington. Wayne made 42% of his three pointers last year and throughout his career in Miami, he's tallied over 1100 three pointers made, good enough for 92nd all time behind Gary Payton. Amidst a flurry of aging, highly reputable new Laker players for the 21-22 season, the youngins who got something to prove got lost in the shuffle. Kendrick Nunn still has a ways to go with his defense and all-around development, but he turned down more money to play in Miami, accepting a contract of just $10 million over two seasons. But the reason I give this deal an A is because it's only going to be Nunn's third pro season, and he displayed electric scoring potential with the Heat. He just turned 26, and with averages of 15 points so far in his young career, Nunn could be a candidate for a breakout year. The Lakers took a chance on Charlotte's number 11 pick from 2017 in the 23-year-old Malik Monk. While never quite living up to expectations as a Hornet, and despite missing 30 games in 2021, when he was on the floor, it was his best season. Monk's coming off a campaign where he took 5.3 three-point attempts per game and knocked down a career best by far, 40.1% of them. And lastly, like Kendrick Nunn and even Malik Monk, Taylor Horton Tucker's another player who could break out as one of LeBron and AD's primary right-hand men. The reason I bring up THT is because he'll be a Laker into the near future after signing a four-year, $32 million extension. Haters argue that the bubble shouldn't count because it wasn't a natural environment with 20,000 fans rocking in the building. First of all, every team was given the same situation, and secondly, the competition in the bubble was some of the most intense basketball I've ever seen. The players were treated well at their Disneyland resort orchestrated by Adam Silver, and the players responded with all-time great performances one after the other. Just think of Jamal Murray and Donovan Mitchell trading 50-point games in a seven-game battle, OG Ananobi's buzzer beater with .6 seconds left, and Lowry going at Tatum and Brown in another crazy seven-game series. It wasn't any easier for the Lakers. They were forced to go through Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum in the first round, Russell Westbrook and James Harden in the second round, then Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic in the conference finals. Aside from a few injuries, all those star players were healthy, but the power from the greatest player of this generation, and one of, if not the best big man in basketball today, Anthony Davis, made Houston, Portland, and Denver look like mere stepping stones, winning in five games three straight times. Butler and Adebayo posed a bigger threat for the Miami Heat in the finals, but regardless, it was a legendary run for the Lakers in my opinion. I see another deep playoff run for LA coming in 2022 with their A-grade offseason. One concern is the health of their aging veterans throughout the 82-game grind and into the playoffs. But the primary worry for the Lakers' title hopes is, of course, the Brooklyn Nets. Comparing LA to Brooklyn is a video for another day, but 
it'd be insane to see those two teams match up in the finals. In your opinion though, are these Lakers legit championship threats? I want to know your take in the comments. Hope you have a great day. DFlow signing off.